Well, thank you for joining us again this evening here at Bible Baptist Church in Bridgeport, Texas. Let's take a couple of minutes, if we might, and open our services in a word of prayer. Lord God, we do thank you so much for what this day means to our faith, Lord, as we rejoice and celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, who today sits on the right hand of the Father, always carrying out intercession for us. And Lord, we tell you, even as we celebrate the resurrection, we're anticipating uh, the gathering together of the house of faith, Lord, when the trump of God should sound according to 1 Thessalonians. And Lord, even as we stand here today, we believe it could be within this day, within tomorrow. And Lord, we celebrate uh, uh, the resurrection uh, and the soon coming of our Savior. Bless us tonight, Lord, as we also will go into the Word of God and spend the time there that we might grow thereby, that we might go out from this place and say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Just a couple of quick announcements. You've noticed that uh, today we kind of changed our time for our services and went from 10 o'clock uh, trying to be able to get uh, on YouTube and back on Facebook or maybe with a little less uh, time uh, involved to upload it. Uh, didn't work. Uh, next week we'll go back to our 11 o'clock hour to our regular hours uh, uh, and uh, uh, just continue on from there. Hopefully this is only another week, maybe two, uh, that then we'll be able to meet back uh, in the house of God together as the body of Christ. Uh, but I believe that it's been a good time uh, doing what we've done. We've been able to stay in touch and uh, we've had so much involvement of our own church body and I thank you for looking in, that being our church uh, and uh, being involved and praying for one another uh, as we normally would do. I miss our Wednesday night, though we're still posting. We started that last week. Remember to tune us in on uh, Wednesday night. We should be aired about 7 o'clock. Uh, uh, we'll be looking forward to meeting you then. But tonight we're a blast. We're going to have a, a, a special, uh, and uh, he's going to come and sing for us. And uh, God bless him for being here tonight. Amen. He's going to play his guitar, too. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he gave his life to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my sin. He lives, I can face tomorrow, because He lives, all fear is gone, because I know He holds a future, and life is worth the living just because He lives. This child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know. And life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross the river, I'll fight life final war with pain. And then as death gives way to lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds a future and life is worth 
because he lives, because I know he holds a future, and life is worth a living just because he lives. Well, thank you, brother. We appreciate that so much. Take us just a minute to move a little bit of this equipment. You might notice that our uh, picture's a little different. We've been going straight up and down vertical. We've got, tried to work it out and have worked it out, I believe, where we can go a little bit more horizontal so that you can put it on your uh, TV or however you're looking at it at a little bit more of a wide, uh, wide angle. We are getting better. We've been doing this th about three weeks now, and we are getting a little better as we go along. Uh, so be patient with us. It's about the time we learn how to do this, we'll be back to assembling uh, together as the body of Christ, and, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, tonight is our Sunday night service. I always enjoy Sunday night because in, uh, when we're meeting together, that's the time when we uh, uh, try to have a little bit more of a relaxed attitude and uh, a little bit more fun in the Scripture. Contrary to what the world thinks, we do have a good time in church and we have a great time with the Word of God. I'm going to invite you uh, this evening to two portions of Scripture, one out of the book of James uh, uh, chapter 1 and the other out of uh, the 1 Corinthians, if you would, when we get back there in just a few minutes, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So just go ahead and uh, uh, mark those two portions of Scripture and then we will be in them. Let us just begin uh, uh, by saying that the, the greatest gift that ever God ever gave to man was His Holy Word. For by His Word He revealed His promises uh, to us even in the beginning uh, when Adam had sinned. He showed us His grace and shared with us uh, the promise of the coming of the Messiah. Now we understand that the Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ and so when we say that the greatest gift God ever gave to man uh, uh, was His Word, we also remember that John chapter 1 says the, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and, and the Word was God and then go on down that same chapter and we hear where it says and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So the Word of God uh, uh, is a written form of Jesus Christ, amen? Uh, and so that uh, we have this Bible by which we can uh, discern who God is in His holiness and who we are as sinners and how God by His grace and love sent Jesus into the world uh, to save us uh, uh, and deliver us from our sins. And then He did this for us. He made this book an open book. He made this book a mirrored book, if you might, whereby we might look into the Word of God uh, uh, and behold our own selves. So we'll go over to James chapter 1 for our first reading beginning in verse 22 for I think I've got three people here tonight so we are uh, a little bit of a small audience. So uh, begin our reading in James chapter 1 and verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, <clears throat> deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and, and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding uh, his natural face in a glass. And he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And then if you would, go back over to 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter uh, 2, where we will be this evening. Uh, oh, though that's our reading for tonight, by the way, my audience can go ahead and be seated. We're going to use first our first Corinthians or second Corinthians, but we won't take time to read it because we're going to use quite a bit of it. Uh, uh, when we look into the Word of God, God intends that we might behold our own selves, that by the revelation of His holiness and by the leadership of the Holy Spirit and by the power of the Word of God, uh, that we should behold who we are. Uh, it is important that each and every day uh, that we rise up from our, from our resting place, from our night of sleep, uh, and begin a day understanding who we are, not just in the world or the job that we work at, but who we are uh, in the eyes of God, who we are as we walk in the presence of God's great grace and love. Amen? And so when we come back to uh, 1 Corinthians, we're going to find that God's going to give to us the opportunity uh, to understand our spiritual condition each and every day. You know, sometimes we preach sermons and we will preach sermons with particular uh, direction to them. Sometimes we preach sermons 
uh, and we preach hard salvation sermons that we might see the lost uh, be converted. Please don't be offended when we talk about lost and saved. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. When we talk about a lost man, that's just exactly what we were before we met God Almighty, and we are saved only by His grace, had nothing to do with us. Amen. Uh, uh, but when we talk about Savior lost, we're just referring to they who know God as Savior and they who do not. We're not declaring ourselves better in any way in this physical realm that we live in uh, than any other man. We are just God's children chose eternally, and it's a great blessing, and we do hold it as a great value. Amen. But when we think about this word, this uh, perfect law, this mirror that we look into that we might know who we are, often we will preach that sermon to the lost man. Sometimes we will preach to encourage uh, uh, the backslidden believer as we talked about this morning. And sometimes we'll preach just to admonish the church as we talked about this morning as well. There are many other sermons that we will find a direction to. Maybe on some holiday we'll preach about the greatness of our nation and then truly we do have the greatest nation in the world. Or sometimes we may preach about the love of mothers or fathers. You know how it is in churches. We do a lot of holiday preaching. Uh, those are hard sermons for me. After 42 years, I've preached 42 different Mother's Day sermons. Amen. So it gets a little bit more, uh, a little bit more difficult. But sometimes God just gives us an opportunity to look into the Word of God and just apply it to everyone that's involved. You know, sometimes we talk about how that there are uh, groups of people in the world, and we, uh, we like to categorize people. We like to talk about uh, what race you're from, or what nationality you are, or what gender you are, or what religion you are. Uh, uh, and we like to categorize people and put them uh, in a little cubicle. Amen? But God only has two classes of, uh, of people in the whole world. He has those that are saved and those that are not. Now when he comes to those who have been blood bought, those who according to what uh, uh, the Gospel of John tells us that have uh, received him as their father become his children, uh, then he categorizes those also in two different categories. One is a spiritual man and the other is a natural man or a carnal man. Amen. And so we have then first the natural man. That's him that uh, walks in this world and enjoys the greatness of his life. But he has no knowledge and no relationship with God. He's natural. He's in the natural condition of the flesh. The other is that spiritual man who is, uh, has come to God and been saved and now walks with the knowledge of God and tries to walk in the fellowship. And like the Old Testament testimony of Enoch, he doth uh, uh, walk each day with God in God's spirit and desires more than anything else in life that he might be pleasing unto his Savior. The third area that, uh, that we divide or have for us tonight as we look into this perfect Word of God is the carnal man. The carnal man is saved, but he's not come out from the world. He's walking uh, uh, in the world while having his, his uh, eternal soul secured by the grace of God. He's never made Jesus the Lord of his life. Oftentimes we as believers will talk about somebody getting saved and then a year or so later how they'll come forward and they'll dedicate their life to the Lord. And I thank God for the, when that does happen, amen? But that ought to be one happening. When you get saved, you ought to give your life totally and wholly to God to walk in the Spirit. But oftentimes that's not so. So there are the natural man, the spiritual man, and the carnal man. Each of those is, re is revealed within the Word of God so that we might know how and who we are as we walk with God each and every day, looking into that perfect law, seeing the reflection of who we are, and not going away and forgetting what manner of man we are each day. Amen? And so we're going to begin as we uh, uh, look at these three different areas that the Word of God reveals us to be. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14, he begins here, But the natural man, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is, I'm sorry, stop right there and we'll just take a moment, and we're going to talk first about this natural man. You understand that every person born into this world came into this world a natural man, having not the knowledge of, of God spiritually in him just because he was born of a woman. We all come into this world without any knowledge of God. Thank God uh, that he does allow us a time of, uh, of, uh, of toleration while we are children, and he allows us that we might 
uh, uh, come to a place to know the difference of right and wrong and recognize by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, by the teaching of spiritual men in this world uh, that we are ourselves natural. That is, we know not God. We have not a personal relationship with God. Amen. We all come into this world according to what Scripture says, uh, uh, lost. Uh, for there's none righteous, no, not one. Amen. For there's none that seek after, seeketh after God, no, not one. Amen. And so the natural man is him that just is born of the flesh, but in the heart and in the spirit, he has no consciousness of God. He's dead in the spirit. Uh, he's dead uh, inside toward God. And the, I can tell you some of the earmarks of that if you're looking into the Word of God. Have you ever sat down to read your Bible and you think, man, that just doesn't make sense to me. Well, first off, this letter or this Bible was written first to convict the man that he is lost, but secondly, it's a love letter to those who love God. And therefore, those who are the natural flesh, uh, as it says here, will re not receive the things of the Word of God, for they are, they are spiritual, amen? Uh, uh, for they are foolishness to him. I recall before I got saved, I got saved at 30. Uh, before that, I thought the Bible was just a bunch of words. Uh, I thought the Bible really was just a, a very long book. If you wanted to sit down and read it, it's not one I would have chosen because it was too long, uh, and it dealt too much about things I didn't understand. And yet then when I be became a saved man, I began to find the Holy Spirit giving leadership and that word beginning to open up. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the natural man is one who has a need uh, to come to know God. Amen. He, and the Bible says uh, that as long as you are not a believer in God, as long as the Holy Spirit is not in you by the uh, repentance of sin and asking God to save you, you are a natural man and you will never understand nor have a uh, a, a knowledge of this word. You see, when a believer reads the Bible, the Bible speaks to him. The only thing this Bible will say to the natural man is that you need to know God and you need to be saved. But it'll say it in a very loud voice. Amen? Uh, so this book, uh, uh, to the natural man, uh, is something that uh, that he cannot understand, that it, he will not have the depth of knowledge. Uh, I can tell you that oftentimes, and in, in doing this some 40 some odd years already, I sit down and read the Bible and I come away scratching my head wondering about what that, name, what that portion may mean or how it might apply to me. But I have something uh, uh, that works within me that comes by uh, God's grace. It's called the Holy Spirit. And when you read the Bible as a saved man, it begins to open up to you and speak to you, maybe even when you don't have all the knowledge or understanding that you may have some time later in the scripture, it still moves upon you. Amen. So the natural man has not other things uh, uh, of God revealed to him. Amen. He's not uh, saved, if you would. I, I, I sometimes think that's such an overworked word, and I sometimes think that we as believers use that word saved and salvation almost like a club uh, to beat people over the head with. Please understand, uh, we're not trying to demean or to, uh, uh, to undermine any, my, any man's standing or to make ourselves bigger or greater than anybody else when we use the word saved or, or unsaved. We're just identifying these groups of people that God identifies in the Bible. Amen. And I'll tell you, every man that's born again, every man that's on his way to heaven came into this world a natural man, a lost man, knowing not God. Amen. And so as we look into this word of God, the first thing we'll notice uh, uh, is that it will reflect uh, the, uh, the viewer as one who either has God or has not God. Uh, and if you have not God, I promise you this, this holy book that you hold in your hand, this Bible as we call it, this 66 books that was authored by the Holy Spirit will bring you to a conviction to recognize who God is and who you are in, in the sight of God. Now God will not force you to be saved. But to the natural man, God will give uh, instructions and opportunity that he might come away from his natural condition and become a born-again believer. Amen? This Bible has two purposes. Number one, to convict the natural man that he needs to be saved. And number two, to teach the believer how to walk uprightly before God in this present world. Amen. We'll come on, we'll, get, we'll deal with that. And so we have first the revelation of the natural man. Now, uh, if you go just a little bit further in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verses 5, the Bible says, But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no, mind, of no man. For who hath uh, known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. He talks about the spiritual man. 
Now, the spiritual man, I guess we would say, is first of, and first and foremost, is a saved man. You can't be a spiritual man unless you are saved. Amen. You cannot walk in the ways of God and know the leadership of the Holy Spirit till first you have that relationship with God that separates you from the old man and gives you a, a, a new future and eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's what has to happen. Amen. If you're to be a spiritual man. And the spiritual man was once just a lost man. Amen. If you ever, ever believer that you've ever seen, no matter uh, who he is, any preacher you've ever met, any deacon you've ever met, any Sunday school teacher you've ever had, anyone that's ever talked to you on the street that says, I love Jesus Christ, can I tell you this? There was a time in his life he did not. There's a time in his life he did not know the Lord. So the spiritual man first is one who has been transformed by the grace of God that he is not uh, the child uh, of this world or the child of the devil, but he's now the child uh, of God. The Bible says, uh, old, old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. He has a new standing place with God, a new consciousness of God that he's never had before, this spiritual man. Once he was doomed and on his way to hell, and now hell has no claim on him. Uh, uh, now he has a home in heaven. He's looking for a city not built uh, with hands. Amen. Once he was, uh, uh, once he was walking in the, uh, in the natural man, once he was walking in the flesh, and now by all desire he walks in the spirit. Let me stop. Being saved and desirous to put the mind of Christ into you daily does not make you perfect. Amen? It makes you striving to be like Jesus. It makes you using this Bible, which is the mirror, the Word of God, to look upon yourself daily and say, this needs to be fixed and this needs to be fixed. It's a continual battle every day to be more like Christ uh, and to be more like uh, what God wants us to be as the Bible describes that, that character and that relationship that we ought to have with God and man. Remember what, when the lawyer came and asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. A spiritual man is striving to love God with all that's within him. And because he loves God, he's reaching out to the world around him. But it is not perfection. We won't be perfect till we get to heaven. Remember, the Bible says uh, uh, that there's going to come a time that this mortality has to put on immortality and this corruption has to put on corruption. Do you hear that word corruption? Those of you who are believers, we believe that there's going to come a time at the rapture of the church that we're going to be caught up out of this place and we're going to put on uh, incorruption. Well, that means that we've got a little corruption to get rid of. So please do not think because we talk about being spiritual minded that we're talking about perfection. We are not. We are talking about being led of the spirit as we look within the word of God daily to find those areas that we need to work on and, and, and correct. And you'll never come to an end of them. Amen. This spiritual man uh, uh, understands that uh, God hath framed the world and has put us in this world for a purpose. And we having eyes do see. The Bible talks about they which have ears that do not hear and eyes that do not see. But they that walk with God that would desire to be a spiritual man will have eyes to see and ears to hear. Eyes to see God's, uh, God's purpose in the world and ears to hear God's, uh, uh, God's message to us. We are that spiritual man. A minded man. Amen. He does not uh, 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 he does not mistreat others just because he thinks he's on his way to heaven and they're not. You know sometimes, uh, this is not my message, I'm going to throw it in anyway. Sometimes we as believers, we become separatist. Uh, some, pre some Christians believe, bless God, we ought to go find us a corner somewhere and get separated from the world so that we don't have to uh, uh, live in the wickedness of the world. God left us in this world to be a light, to be a testimony. He didn't say go get separated. Uh, can I tell you, you'll never influence a, a man who's unsaved to come to know your God and to walk uh, uh, with you uh, into eternal life uh, by, the, by the leadership of the Holy Spirit if you don't know any of them. Bless God, we ought to have unbelieving friends. And I don't mean somebody we're just out trying to lord it all. I'm talking about friends. People who mean something to you. Because if their soul doesn't mean anything, or if they don't mean anything to you, their soul won't mean anything to you. Amen? So we need to have that understanding of who and what they are uh, in the world and who we are to them. The spiritual man uh, has the mind of Christ. Look in verse 16. 
For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. As we, I think last Sunday night, we may have said this, this book reveals to us the mind of Christ. You can look into this mirror of the word as a spiritual man and begin to determine pretty quickly whether you truly are spiritual or you're just filled with pride. Amen? Because if you are doing the things of God, remember what James said? Let me go back and uh, remind you. Listen to this. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. If all you do is read the Bible and never put it into practice, you're deceiving your own self. You're not spiritual minded at all. For it says here in verse 22, for if any man hear the word, and do and not and, and I'm sorry and not a doer he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass and for he beholdeth himself and goeth away and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he is amen oh I, I'll tell you mirrors are something I've gotten a little bit of how shall I say I don't like them much anymore I look in the mirror every day I try to stay clean shaven and uh, every day that I look in the mirror I see my daddy looking back. Uh, I'm 70, almost 74. I'll be 74 at the end of next month, uh, uh, and I have aged somewhat. Uh, I can see in my mind, I can see in my mind when I went into the military. I was 17 years old when I went into the Army, and I've got some pictures of me and uh, my brother as we went into the Army and how young we were and how baby-faced we were. And uh, uh, You know, I don't look like that anymore. I look into the mirror, and I really see what what I look like. But you know, once I get through shaving and rinse off that shaving soap and dry my face and, and put my clothes on and walk out of that bedroom, I don't think about that old man looking back until the next morning when I shave that face. The Bible is my looking glass all day long that I might see who I am and not forget who I am and understand that uh, those things that I see, they will either say to me, you are doing well or you are not doing well. The word of God will reveal me for what I am. That's why a lot of people don't like to come to church because the word of God is preached and it tells us or reveals to us who we are. We can't make believe, we can't hide from the uh, leadership of the Holy Spirit for it will reveal to us who we truly are, whether we be natural, that is uh, having not a relationship with God or whether we be uh, uh, spiritual, that is walking uh, with God and having the mind of Christ, amen? Now the book of Revelation chapter three when dealing with the church at Laodicea <clears throat> kind of identifies uh, uh, these two conditions of man. Amen. Uh, he talks about uh, how the church at Laodicea was just lukewarm and kind of made Jesus sick. But before that, uh, he said, I would that you were uh, either hot or cold. Either be a Christian or be a non, or don't be a Christian. But don't just be lukewarm. Amen. Two classes of people that God recognizes in this world, saved and lost. He doesn't recognize gender. He does not recognize a nationality. He does, for God loveth all men. He does not recognize uh, any division that we might make. He doesn't recognize the difference between Baptist uh, uh, and, and, and some other faith. He does not recognize uh, anything. The only thing he recognizes are those that are saved and those that are lost. Now I will tell you there's a lot of religion in the world uh, that walks under the banner of Christianity that does not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, therefore they preach not the truth. Okay, now we don't, so I didn't want to leave that open, amen? So uh, uh, we have this condition uh, that, uh, uh, that there are saved and lost. But then God says, as you look into this perfect law, as you look into this mirror, to be a doer of the word, to recognize who you are and not go away and forget so quickly what manner of man you are, he's going to take that little group called saved, that little group called born again, that group that have been uh, to the cross and that have been washed in the blood, that have got uh, their names written in the Lamb's book uh, 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 for all eternity according to Revelation. That book, now he's going to say, let's talk about those people. Amen? Let's talk about those who name the name of Jesus and say, if I die or when I die, I'm going to heaven. He says, now I want to divide that group. I want to divide them into the area of not just spiritual that we've just talked about, but I want, to, I want to show you another group in that group of people called saved. Please understand, when we talk about this group of people in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, the Bible calls them carnal-minded. Carnal-minded. Now, a carnal-minded man 
is the worst testimony for the cause of Christ and the gospel. He's a worse testimony than a lost man because he, he tells everybody how he's going to heaven. He claims the eternal promises, but he lives not at all for the cause of Christ. He's carnal minded. Amen? Now, so go with me into chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians and see this division of this group of people that are saved and will one day be in heaven with God because we are eternally kept. For I know whom I believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I'm saved by grace, Ephesians uh, chapter uh, 2 and verses 8 and 9 tells me. Amen. Not by works, but by grace. Amen. And so it's all about what he's done and nothing about what I've done. But in that group of people that God has received by their test, by their asking for forgiveness, uh, uh, he's going to say, now let's divide that group into two groups. Number one, spiritual, we just talked about them. Number two, carnal. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. Amen. I'm born again, yes. On their way to heaven, yes. When the trump of God sounds, they're going to go to heaven, yes. But the Bible says they're not spiritual minded. Listen, it'll go a little further. But as unto carnal, as unto carnal, even unto babes in Christ. Now, first off, let me uh, uh, confirm for you that when a man gets saved, no matter what age he is, he's born into the family of God as a babe. Amen? He's in need of spiritual growth and he's in need of going or growing into uh, uh, to a mature believer, into one who now does not need to be taught but is able to teach others. That's the focus and the purpose of spiritual growth. Amen? Uh, but there is a time when everyone are babies. Aren't babies gorgeous? I love children, amen? But isn't it sad to see a, a, a 20-year-old man still acting like he's 10 years old? acting like he's a spoiled little baby. It's not a pleasant thing, amen? So there's a time that's a necessity to be a babe in Christ, but the, uh, but the babe should be instantly involved with growing. We begin with a child the day he's born. We begin to nurture him and we begin to in, encourage him to grow and to mature and to learn to talk and to learn to walk and uh, uh, then to learn to run and then to learn to read and to, uh, uh, to become a, a, a full uh, a citizen of, of our nation, a productive person. It's all a process process of life. So there's a time when babes are exciting. There's nothing more exciting in a church than seeing people getting saved. Amen. Coming into the, into the family of God as babes in Christ and beginning to grow and mature. It's an exciting time uh, uh, for the church when these things are going on. But when we have need to be past that, that time of babyhood, when we ought to ourselves then becoming or should be mature and we're still acting like children, then God says that we are carnal. And he says, I can't speak to you as unto spiritual or mature Christians, if you would, but as unto even babes. And verse 2 says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for here unto you were not able to bear it. That's what we were talking about. There's a time of the necessity of infancy. And we, we do whatever is necessary. We feed with milk. We feed with pablin. You know how we do with babies to bring, uh, bring a point where they're able to eat more solid stuff and able to uh, begin to digest. The Word of God is not in all places is simple and yet it has uh, the ability to feed even babes off the milk of the word of God. Yeah. Amen. But when one who is should, should be mature and is not, they are considered to be carnal and still not able to deal with anything in the Bible, anything that requires a mature spiritual walk. Uh, uh, they're still a child. They're still needing milk when they should be past the time of milk. One illustration quickly, I don't want to keep you too long tonight. I love milk. And when I was a child, I lived on a farm and we milked cows and we had all the milk you could drink. I went in the military and while I was in the military, you'd go into the mess halls and uh, there in the mess hall somewhere, they would have these coolers up against the wall and they had these big deals of milk in them and you'd go over and get it. It was so cold and uh, I'd just drink milk and drink milk. I love milk. Amen? And babies grow by milk and bones are formed and made strong by milk uh, because it's the necessity of growing up. Can I tell you what happens if you drink too much milk after you get grown? Amen? You end up with things called kidney stones. 
You know, that milk becomes something that, uh, though you may enjoy the taste of it, we should move on to something that's a little bit more palatable to our body where it is at that time. Amen. I still sometimes will break down and get me a big old glass of milk, and I like it just as cold as you can get it. But every time I begin to drink it, I think about those kidney stones. Amen. And God says milk is good, but there's a time when milk should be something that you have just as a pleasurable thing, not something that you have as a necessity for your life. You should be on the meat and potatoes by then. Amen. Amen. And so here he talks about a carnal man. Now a carnal man, notice this uh, in verses 3, For ye are yet carnal, whereas there is among you envy and strife and division. Are ye not carnal, and walk as men? A carnal man is reflecting the character of that natural man. A carnal man is walking according to what feels good to his flesh. He has, uh, did you notice what they said? Uh, that he has this envying. The Bible tells us that we ought not to have an envious spirit. Uh, it tells us that we have strife and division. The Bible says God, uh, or these six things God hateth, and one of them is him that has uh, sown division in the brethren. So these are things that reflect the reflect not a spiritual man and this carnal man then is confused. He's acting like the world while he's the child of God. Isn't that confusing? Uh, that's, have you ever had a child, uh, uh, maybe a neighbor child or something? I had this. Uh, when, I, when my sons, uh, when my youngest son was, we were in New Mexico pastoring and he met this uh, young man when he, the first day of school, he went, when we moved, moved out there, I think he was in the seventh grade, I can't remember, maybe the sixth. And a young man about the, in his class, came home with him that night. And I think he stayed, before he ever went home again, probably two years. His name's John. He's just like one of my sons. He's, he still lives in Houston. He's grown now, married, has his own children. But uh, for the whole time, from the time my son met him, he came into my house, stayed there, wore my son's clothes. I never, they were the same size, so I didn't have to buy him clothes. He just shared my son's, amen? Uh, when we went to the table to eat, he was there, amen? Uh, uh, he was one who was not, uh, what should we say? He was not one of my children, but he acted like he was. Can I tell you sometimes people that are not the children of God act better than the children of God do? They have a better attitude. They have a better, a better love of people. And I'm telling you, it's just, it ought not to be that way. But in this, in this present world, there are those who, when you talk to them about whether they're going to heaven, they say, oh, yes, I'm saved. But then you back off and you look at their life and you say, are you sure? Because they walk not as those who believe in God. They walk as those who have no faith at all. And they're confused about whose camp they belong in. Amen. So they are, uh, this natural man lives for the moment, not for the eternal blessings of God. He lives uh, for what he can have today, not for what God can bless him with. And he counts those things that come his way as his own earning by his own hand. He did it himself and he gives God not the glory. He's a carnal minded believer. Amen. The spiritual man, he lays up treasures in heaven and the carnal man, he lays them up in the bank. He lays up treasures in heaven, the spiritual man, and the carnal man wants to count his now. Or the Bible, I heard a man say, well, if, my, if God owes the cattle on a thousand hills, I wish he'd sell three or four of them and give me the money. Would you trade eternal blessings for temporal gold and silver that will pass away? The carnal man says, yes, I'll take it now. And so that when you get to heaven, according to 1 Corinthians, all that you've done in this world, wood, hay, and stubble, gold, and silver, and precious stone, you're going to uh, 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 lose it all. But if you go over to 1 Corinthians, we don't have time to do so, and you read where that, uh, uh, that, uh, that foundation is laid that cannot be laid in any other but Christ Jesus, and then all of our works are taken and tested by the fire. If everything that carnal Christian, that carnal believer has is burned up by the fire, he's done nothing for the glory of God, yet is he saved, if I might put it in my grandmother's vernacular, by the skin of his teeth or by the blood of the cross. Amen? Amen. So he's carnal, isn't he? And carnality, this carnal character that's in a man, contradicts his testimony of faith. I know a particular example in my life that, uh, that uh, I know, very, know that uh, tells me often that he's saved and he knows God, uh, but when I look at his life, it seems to be so contradictory. And I'm not judging him, but it causes me to worry that maybe he don't know God because all I can see is the outside. 
All I can see is how he walks. Uh, amen? And so this carnal man, his life, his envy and his strife and the division and, 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 and that he walks as men walk. And that means those who are natural, that knows not God. He walks in that camp. Uh, uh, he does not know the, uh, the things of God. And he's giving off that contradic contradictory testimony. Amen? He knows to do right. He chooses not to. He knows to walk with God. He chooses to walk in his own lust. He knows the world is lost and has no hope, and he walks as though he cares not one bit. Amen? He might be the one you'll hear say, I have my ticket punched. The rest of you are on your own. How sad that a believer would be like that. Amen. He's kind of like Lot. You remember when God went down with the angels to, Lot, uh, to Sodom and told Lot that he needed to get out because it was about to be destroyed? And it, read, the, read the context, read the text there, how long it takes those angels to convince Lot to leave the world. You know, when he went out of the world, uh, uh, he takes two of his daughters and, uh, uh, and his wife with him, and as they're leaving out of Sodom, uh, his wife looks back and is turned to a pillar of salt because her heart was in Sodom not with God. I wonder when the trump of God sounds how many carnal-minded Christians as God is sweeping them up to glory is going to look back and mourn the loss of the world in their life. Amen? Can I tell you Lot lingered in Sodom so long that he lost everything of value in this world to him? He lost his sons and his daughters and his sons-in-laws and his daughters-in-laws and his grandchildren. He came out with a wife who was turned to a pillar of salt and two daughters uh, who, through sin in their life, are going to raise up two, na two uh, nations that are going to be enemies of Israel forever. The carnal man needs to make this change. He needs to make a full and complete commitment to God, to make God the Lord of his life, to take himself off the throne and the rulership of his days and put God on the throne of his life. Amen. He needs to uh, walk in the spirit of God and begin to ask God for an understanding of who he is according to what James says as he looks in to the word of God. It's never too late to grow up in the spiritual sense. Never too late, late to grow up naturally either, amen? Uh, I, I, I often say on Mother's Day when we're preaching a Mother's Day message that the day young ladies get married, they have their first child. It's called their husband uh, because I, I do believe this. Too often, we're uh, just little boys in big bodies. Our, our, our toys just cost more money. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to grow up. Uh, 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 naturally or physically in this world and sometimes it's hard to grow up spiritually but it is a necessity. Isn't it sad when we see families whose father uh, is one who still acts like he's 15 when he's 35 and he's got 15 year old children. Amen. There's a necessity to grow up, to commit ourselves to the things that are necessary to be the right kind of father, to see our children grow up and become the right kind of parents. In a spiritual sense, that's true as well. We need to commit ourselves to God and begin to grow up so that we might be the example set for, before others that they also can grow into the spiritual maturity of a man that God would have us to be. It's never too late to do that. Amen. We just have to commit ourselves and make him Lord of our life. So as we look into the word of God here out of James, as it told us, uh, uh, be a, a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Look into the word of God and see what manner of man are you. Uh, uh, we look into that word tonight and then I would ask you this. According to your choices, how, what are you? Are you the natural man? You've never met God. You've never had a personal encounter with God. I don't care how often you go to church. I don't care how long you've been in Sunday school. I don't care uh, who your mom and daddy is. I don't care about any of those things. Christianity or faith being saved is a personal encounter with God whereby you repent of your sins and ask God to save you. If you've not done that, you are a natural man. Doesn't mean you're of poor character. Doesn't mean that you don't do well, you're not, you don't support your family. It means you have no relationship with God. Amen? 
If you're a spiritual man, that just means that you've met God personally, you've made him Lord of your life, you're not perfect, but you're striving to see your weaknesses and see your failures each and every day so that you can uh, strengthen those things and you can add the power of the Spirit of God and you can become more uh, 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 like Christ every day. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable. And if you go down to the end of those verses, it says that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's what we're doing in this world, folks. We're maturing so that we can be uh, the example and the testimony of God in all good works. Not so we get the bows or the accolades, but so God does. Amen. Amen? And then if you are here and you are carnal-minded, you are a carnal man, you have uh, 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 the, the need for milk and you, you can't deal with anything deep of the spiritual thing. You know, so often preachers have to preach on uh, from the pulpit and they have to preach the milk because of the immaturity of the believers, amen? That's why I like Sunday night and Wednesday night so much. I get to do more with the believer, uh, the spiritual man. I, need, I get to do a little bit deeper uh, uh, diving into the Word of God. But so often on Sunday we have to preach the milk of the Word of God so that we might uh, see the, the, the natural man that sits in the pew hear that God loves him so that we might have the carnal man uh, sitting on the pew know that he needs to make Jesus the Lord of his life. And even in the milk, can I tell you, those of you that are, that are striving to be that spiritual man so that you can be like Paul and the end of your day you can say, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. You're walking with God. And can I tell you, the milk sometimes is pretty good. Amen. The milk doesn't add anything to your growth so much as, 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 as uh, uh, like milk on the bone after you get a certain age. It doesn't help you. It just causes you some problems. But the milk of the word of God is always sweet, yeah. like the honey in the honeycomb. Amen. And you can, I can preach on here on Sunday morning and I can preach things I know that half my congregation already know. They're already excited about. They've, they've had it preached to them a, a, a hundred times and sat here and listened to them wave their hand and shout hallelujah because the milk is so good. It just excites us about that. Amen. So as we look into the word of God, what manner of man are you? It's a choice. Amen. You can be that natural man. You can walk as, and have no relationship with God. God won't force you to be saved. He offers you the opportunity, but he won't force you. If you are that natural man and you're tired of it and you know God loves you, you just bow your head right where you are and you ask God to forgive your sins and save your soul. And if you mean it, Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, God will do it. For uh, the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're that carnal man, then you need to bow your head and say to God, I now commit myself to you and make you Lord of my life, that I will begin to walk by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and I will examine the word daily to see what manner of man I am, that I might become that mature uh, uh, spiritual man. And if you're a spiritual man here today, and you know you're right with God, you're doing all you can, you're not perfect, but you're right with God, then you rejoice in that walk you have with God and understand its value. Because him, him that think of himself too highly will lose what he's got. Amen? Be cautious. Look into the word of God and see what manner of man you are. Lord God, we thank you for the day. We pray, God, you will bless the message tonight. We pray, Lord, that you will just uh, help it to encourage us and convict us or convert us. Whatever the need, Lord, we put it in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.